On the 30th of March 2005, 23-year-old James Connor was walking home through the north inner city of Dublin. Not in a rush, he stopped at Ballybock Bridge and looked down at some teenagers who were fishing. One of the lads called up to him and said they thought there was a dummy in the water. Curious, James came down to have a closer look. And when he saw a leg with a sock on it, he knew it wasn't a mannequin. And so he immediately called 999. And so began one of Ireland's most notorious murder cases. At 6.56pm, Glenn Manelli of Tara Street Station received the call. He directed two fire engines and an ambulance and they were on scene by 6.58. Officer Derek Carroll arrived just after 7pm and he instructed the firemen to do a drag. So it's like it's like nearly like a long pitchfork um, that goes like this. And so basically you can claw at anything in the water. When they dragged the water, a left arm came out. And Derek knew immediately that it was human. So the area was sealed off. Gardaí from Fitzgibbon Garda Station arrived at 7.05pm. Detective Inspector Christy Mangan would be in charge of the investigation. And so when he arrived and saw the different body parts floating in the canal, he immediately ordered a murder inquiry. At 9.30pm, Dr. Y.M. Fakie of Whitehall uh, GP Practice arrived. I'm sorry if I said his name wrong. He arrived and, sorry, it's a bit, it just sounds a bit bizarre, but he, they had to have a doctor come and pronounce the victim dead. So he arrived at 9.30 and pronounced them dead. All the witnesses were interviewed. There were door-to-door -door inquiries carried out like immediately. Overnight then, um, they would have to wait until the next morning to kind of start the investigation. And so Gardy had to be there around the clock to make sure Obviously, no one interfered, but also to check, like keep an eye on the body parts because the body parts were still in the water. They had to stay there. Um, so even though they had, you know, identified bits and stuff, it had to be put back in. And um, just like white sheets of paper were basically left at sides of the canal to indicate like this is where an arm was. This is where the torso was when we found it and stuff. At 10 p.m. that night, the first of many conferences were held for the Gardaí. And their main priority was to identify the body in the water. So the following morning on the 31st of March at 8 a.m., Detective Geraldine Doherty arrived on scene. And so she started collecting samples. So she picked up um, cigarette butts, chewing gum, you know, different bits like rubbish and papers and stuff like that. There was feces. She took some of that as well because obviously they had to rule out if that could have been the person, this type of thing. At 8.30 a.m., the Subaqua team arrived and it was a team of four. There was the dive supervisor, that was Sergeant John Bruton. Garda Eamon Bracken set up the equipment. So basically the film equipment was called Colour Watch. And then the other two Garda would be the ones who'd actually go into the water and they would record like what was under it and Bracken would be out kind of monitoring it. So Garda Owen Ferreter and Brian Brannock, they were the ones who actually went into the water. So... Before they even um, began the dive, they were able to remove the torso because it was just there at the side of the canal. So one of them held open the body bag and the other one kind of like lifted it in. And then they used a stretcher to lift it up off onto the canal walkway. Both Gardaí could clearly see multiple stab wounds on the torso. So the dive began at 9.55 a.m. And it was basically like an underwater survey. As I said already, they would record, you know, what they were seeing. And this was for if it was needed, it could be used in court later. It was all recorded. So this took 45 minutes and they removed the torso. They removed two arms. They removed four parts of a leg, like legs. So the lower parts and the upper parts. And they removed um, like the bum, basically the buttocks is what they say. They do not find a head, even though they search thoroughly. Each body part would be sealed in a separate bag, and these were all passed on to the Garda Technical Bureau. They continued searching, obviously, for more pieces, for the head, for anything else that they might see up and down the canal. And by 11.10, they were out of the water. Samples of the canal water were also taken by uh, Garda Doherty. The local um, funeral director, Stafford, was asked to transport the body to the city mortuary. So they'd done that. The parts were actually x-rayed 
and then the postmortem began at 7 p.m. by the state pathologist Dr. Michael Curtis. So when the body parts were actually in the water, they had been in it so long that the skin had lightened. So the water and the sun essentially like lightened the skin. So at first they thought it was a, a white person. But the postmortem revealed that it was a healthy black male. They, the age range was 20 to 30 and that they were about six foot. So they said that when they put the body parts together, the measurements was like five four. So then they said it would have been closer to six foot if you were to put a head there as well the head and the neck um one of the hands of the arm was clenched in a fist position the body was of athletic build so on the body there was a jersey a football jersey on like the torso so it was um the ireland away jersey so it was an uh, it completely like it was white and it had like the little logo and stuff on it i'll put it up for you guys the lower part like so where the genitals and the bum were that was another body part and that had white underpants and then the two feet had um, like dark grey socks on them. So the pathologist actually like obviously took down the underwear or whatever he'd done. And it was revealed that there was no penis. So the testicles were there and the pubic hair was there. But the penis had been amputated. They had not found this in the search. The body showed no defensive wounds. And it was shown that the bones were cut with a sharp object but that some of the fractures weren't clean so they believe a blunt instrument was also used the torso or the trunk had 22 stab wounds and 18 of them were between this area like so between the neck and the nipples there were four to the stomach the colon and the bladder were pierced several times there was a cut to the liver and then there was damage to the kidney, but it was superficial. So they actually believed that that was probably just during the dismemberment that it had, it had been damaged. The same as there was damage to three kidneys. And again, they assume it was from during the dismemberment. The heart was cut, like stabbed twice, but it hadn't actually pierced through into the heart like it was on the outer side. There was alcohol detected in the blood, but they couldn't determine like how much what the level was. Um, other than this, like the pathologist would say that it was a healthy male. Um, he was an athletic build and his, his organs were in good, healthy condition. He determined that the cause of death was the stab wounds to the trunk. Although because there was no head, he said that he, it couldn't be like definitively said that that's what actually killed him. So they took um, blood samples. They took swabs of like the hair, the pubic hair, the anus, the nails. They took uh, bone marrow samples, blood tissue, mus like muscle tissue samples and stuff. These samples would all be sent to Dr. Hilary Clark in Forensic Science Ireland. And so she would test them. She would also test the clothing that was found. And a uh, tea towel had also been found in the canal. So she would test this too. Just a quote from Dr. Michael Curtis in one of the books. This is the Irish Scissor Sisters. I can list them all. Um, this man's body had been dismembered. Dismemberment would have occurred after he had succumbed to multiple penetrating wounds. In the course of the dismemberment, the, th the soft tissues had been cut relatively clean with a sharp knife or similar implement, while the bones had been severed relatively clumsy by repeated chopping actions from an instrument or instruments such as an axe or a cleaver. The head, and not, the head and neck had not been recovered at the time of postmortem. The penis had been amputa amputated and was not recovered. I always find it interesting. So obviously the investigation starts and then people come forward to be like, oh yeah, I saw this and I saw that. And I've spoken about that in other things before where like people heard like in um, the death, the murder of Celine Cawley, I said how like a neighbour said they heard screaming. And it's only then after she's murdered that it's like, oh, yeah, like to tell the guys, like, oh, I heard a scream. Yeah, at that time of the day. Like, I don't know, but I just feel like report it. It might be nothing, but is it not better to report it? And if it was something, you know, something might have been done, something could have been prevented. So anyway, rant over. So a couple of people who came forward then to say that they had also seen the body. So I'm just going to read from my notes. I'm sorry. So on the 21st of March, Margaret Gannon was walking to school that morning. She was bringing her, sorry, she wasn't walking to school. She was walking her son and her niece to school. And as they went over the bridge, 
the son said like what's that you know and they looked in and they saw like a black bag something in a black bag wrapped up and she said that it did resemble like that of a of a body um, and it was kind of caught in like reeds or something and the niece even said oh is that another body referring to remember the case that I done of Adrian Bastia when his body had been found in this same canal and so she kind of said no or whatever and then continued on and then the next day she said the kids said nothing about it and so she didn't kind of really think about it she went on she would later say that she knew it was the 21st because it was her husband's birthday then on the 25th of March uh young lad Paul Carney he saw right he was cycling by and he saw an arm with a fist clenched okay and again, so he kind of thought it was like that could have been a dummy or something. And he actually rang his dad and said like, oh, there's a mannequin in the in the canal. And his dad was kind of like, oh, would you go away out of that? And so that was that. And then on the same day that it was discovered, there were other kids and teenagers and stuff fishing at the canal. Um, and then there was a man, David O'Connor, and he was actually walking along the canal with his two daughters. And they had stopped kind of, you know, to have a look at the lads fishing and this and that. And he saw, um, it was a good day, so the water was quite clear. And he saw a plastic bag, like, at the bottom of the canal. That one, fair enough, the last one kind of was a bit, you know. But the others, like, if you thought it was something, I don't know. Like, you don't even have to say it to you. Just ring anonymously and be like, here, listen, I think there could have been, like, a body in the canal. I don't understand why people wait until after the fact to come forward and be like, yeah, I saw it. Now, obviously, what would have helped there was then they knew that it had been there since at least the 21st of March. The fingerprints and palm prints of the deceased were taken. They were run through like the national database and then actually the asylum seeker database because he was black. And at this time, there was there was a lot of um, immigrants from Africa coming through. We had very lax immigration laws at the time, they would say. And it was actually reported that at around this time, there were 60 uh, black men like from like who had come in from Africa that were were kind of like missing at the time and so actually when this all came out loads of people got in touch to say like oh it could be this person could be that and that took a lot of energy and time from the investigation because they obviously had to interview all those men's families and friends and stuff to try see if it was them anyway there was no hits and they also sent the details to europol and to interpol and again there was no hits so on the second day, the 31st of March, they actually held a press conference and showed the clothes that the deceased was wearing in a bid to obviously try jog someone's memory. The case also appeared on that month's crime call and there was a plea also put out to like landlords to check on missing tenants and a fair few actually came forward again that would have been kind of the 60, you know, included in the 60 uh, men that had had kind of gone missing the crime stoppers actually put up a ten thousand euro reward for information on the identification of the body like not even to catch who was responsible or anything just if they could identify the body so also then because they determined that he could have been from you know that he could have come in from um, one of the countries in africa they reached out to the african community so different pastors were asked to kind of say it at their you know, their church, their mass, you know, their prayer readings, all this stuff to ask people if they knew anything. There was also a thing called the Metro Air, which was like a newspaper for immigrants. And so the appeal was also put in that. Gardaí, it was Fitzgibbon Garda Station and Mount Joy Garda Station, I think. And other, you know, like other stations, had, like Gardaí had to be drafted in from other stations to help with the investigation because there was just so much to do. CCTV was looked at from around the area of Ballybock and stuff to see if there was anything, you know, suspicious or nefarious going on. Another thing that I thought was really interesting was isotope analysis was done on the deceased's bones. So this examines the bone density and like what minerals are in the bone, like the contents. And so they done that. And then what they done was all the guard stations in Dublin a guard took a water sample from their station and sent them off. And so this was able to determine that for at least the last six months of this man's life, he lived in the location of Fitzgibbon Guard Station. It says there was like freshwater prawns. I didn't know, maybe that's a stupid thing to say. I wouldn't have known it was prawns in the canal. 
but they were like in the body um and so they determined that the body had been in the water for kind of like a week or more so because the head obviously because the body was dismembered but because the head had been taken and the penis had been taken they looked at the possibility that it could have been like a ritual killing and this was also because there had been there had been a, a 2001 case in London where a body was found, the torso of a little African boy was found in the River Thames. And he has never actually been identified, but they were able to determine it was like a ritual killing because of the way his body had been cut and what was found in his stomach was like some plant or something that was used in these ritual killings. And that little boy has never been identified. Now, if you look, there are, there is a photo out there of a little boy and he was identified. But then the woman who had said that it was this boy then said, no, that wasn't him. This is his name, but that's a different boy. And it's very complicated if you want to look it up. It's very sad, though, this little boy and still never been identified. I think they believe that he was actually trafficked in to the UK for the purposes of the ritual killing. So because they thought it could have been a ritual killing, they actually touched base with Gerard Labouchon, who was from the South Africa's investigative psychiatric unit. He was an expert on uh, Muti, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, or like black magic. So he actually didn't think that the case fit a typical ritual killing, but he agreed to help the guardie. So Detective Jerry MacDonald was actually in the middle of kind of getting ready to head over to South Africa to speak to him in person when the body was identified. So on the 16th of May, Muhammad Ali Abu Bakar contacted Gardi and said that he was worried because his friend Faris Wale Noor hadn't been seen in like over a month. He said the last time he saw him was on the 20th of March on O'Connell Street and that Farah was with his girlfriend um, Kathleen and her two daughters. He said that Farah was like extremely drunk and he was asking him was he okay because Farah was tended to get like uh, aggressive and start fights and stuff when he was drunk. So he was kind of saying are you okay Um, you know take it easy and stuff and that his girlfriend was like he's fine and kept trying to pull him away. Mohammed said that he knew it was the 20th of March because him and his girlfriend were actually in town for like an intercultural festival so they knew it was that date because they were on their way there when they saw him. They said that he was wearing his white away Ireland jersey. He said that in the, you know, the coming weeks after, he was trying to get in touch with him. He rang him. He rang and he said once an Irish, like an Irish man's voice answered and said it was a wrong number and then kind of didn't answer. He never got through again. He said he checked with other people in their community and no one had seen Farah like that in over a month. Now, Farah was actually only five foot six but in one of the books, it kind of says that the postmortems are, are estimates. Like, again, he was actually 38. And so they had said between 20 and 30. So the Guardian were kind of like, no, well, this guy's 38. He's not six foot, this type of thing. So at first, they actually weren't really sure. But anyway, they obviously investigated it. And so through their investigation, they found that he was an asylum seeker. And it was also discovered that he had a son a few years beforehand with an Irish woman. So any of the so there'll be a couple of victims who if I say a name it's not their name there's like different names named for them so I'm just going to pick one that was from one of the books because they're always different names so it's just to protect their identity so it's just two girlfriends that we'll be talking about so I'm just going with Paula because that's what one of the books call her so they track down Paula and the son and the son is about uh five or six at this stage and so she goes in to tell her story of her and Farah which I will get to um, and she allows them to take a swab from her son to see if the DNA matches the body because they know that, like she says, Farah is this boy's son, uh, dad. So they just want to see if it is him. They do that. And obviously it takes a few weeks to come back. So the DNA results come back and it is confirmed that the torso in the canal is Farah Swale Noor. Farah Swale Noor, an asylum seeker from war-torn Somalia, was actually Shailila Saeed Salim. He was born on the 2nd of July, 1967, in Kenya. And so this is where he grew up, in Mombasa. He was a fisherman. He married Husna Saeed, and they had three children. Samo in 1989, Mohammed in 1990, 
and Zula in 1991. But Shalila soon got fed up of this life. He didn't, he wanted more and he wanted to go to Europe. And so he had been told that like that there were countries that would have had more lax immigration laws. And so he decided he wanted to come to Ireland. And so he left. So he told his wife that once he got set up, you know, wherever he was going, that he would then, you know, send for her and the children. But this was never part of his plan. So on December 30th, 1996, he landed in, in Dublin from a flight from Rome in Italy. And he immediately claimed asylum. So he essentially said that he fled from war-torn Somalia. He said that his wife had been killed. Some sources say that he said his children were also killed. And in others, he says that he doesn't know where they were, that they were taken. He says that he then fled to Nairobi in Kenya and that he was in one of these kind of refugee camps there. And he was there for a few years until he managed to save up $1,600 to pay a trafficker to get him out of the country. So he basically says that the trafficker got him to Rome, that he got a flight then to Dublin. Uh, when he was asked obviously like where was his passport and stuff like that he said that he just had to run he couldn't uh, take everything but I don't understand then how you got on the planes I don't and that's obviously that's actually like a thing now that's a bone of contention of people who will arrive and they don't have a passport and it's kind of like well how did you get on the plane you had to have had one and there's a story kind of of people ripping up their passports in you know airport toilets and this type of stuff anyway Shalila's father died when he was young his name was Sayyid Salim um and so there was his mother and his older brother who's three years older and he actually left in 1991 to go to Toronto. Shalila was then housed in different uh, um, refugee accommodation and then on January 14th 1997 he went to like an asylum interview where he filled out forms and on the form he said that his name was Farah Sawale Noor. He said his wife Hajila had been murdered and that he didn't know where his kids were. Again, another source says that they were also killed. He said he was from the Bajun tribe. He gave like a P.O. box for his address. P.O. box 25 Shigari. I don't know how legit that sounds. He said that he had been privately educated, but that he left without any qualifications. He said he fled in May 1991 and had been living in the refugee camp in Nairobi up until 1996 when he had the money to leave. He would say like that the trafficker wanted $2,000 and he told them like all he could manage was 1600 and they agreed. So the whole thing with refugee, like asylum seekers, you're supposed to kind of, the first safe country that you get to is supposed to be the country that you kind of stay in. And so this is kind of where the whole economic migrants or, econ you know, economic um, asylum seekers, whatever you want to call them, come in where they don't want to go because the first country to go to isn't prosperous. They want to go to another one. And so this is a whole kind of thing. But anyway... So basically, when he was asked why he didn't seek refuge in Kenya, he said, Kenya is not a good country for a refugee. No food in camp. Giriyama tribe people do not like Somali people. Kenyan police do not like Somali people. Police steal from Somali people. And so I'm actually just going to read out, um, like, the, the you have to put a, a statement on the form. So I'm just going to read it out for you. My name is Farah Sawale Noor. I was born in Somalia on the 2nd of July 1967 in Mogadishu. My father and my mother, they all Somali. I have one brother. I'm second born in my family. I used to be a fisherman in Kismayo. I was working with fisheries departments. I start work from 1982 to 1990. From 1990, the war started to spread. So the war was worse, more than worse than they decided. Then I decided to go back to Mogadishu and see my family. When I reached Mogadishu, I went to my family house. The door was open. When go inside, nobody was in. The only thing I saw was the dead body of my wife. She ha she was having a bullet in her chest. I started panic and I was afraid then. I didn't know what to do because the war was spread all over the country. Then I decided to take some few stuff. I started to walk towards Port Mogadishu. When I arrived there, I got a small boat to go back to Kismayo. When I reached Kismayo, I saw a lot of people leaving country in big boat. I rushed there and I asked where's boat going. One of them is telling me Kenya. We spent three days to Mombasa. There were no doctors, no food, no water and overcrowding. There were many refugees from my country. They don't like Somalia people to be in their country. Sometimes to come to camp nighttime and start to attack us and sometimes kill some refugees. So I was afraid with that. Also, I was lucky to find the agent. So this is the trafficker that he says that he paid 1600 to. 
So then on the 2nd of June, 1998, Farah was interviewed by, uh, you know, an officer of the asylum department or whatever. Now, I just, I'll just point out, I suppose, if you think that's bad from like January 97 until Jan June 1998, it's even worse now. It takes forever. And part of, the pro part of it is because if it's refused, they appeal and this and that and all. But people are in like direct provision now. If you look it up, you'll see it. Um, years, like years and years and years. So basically, he just kind of reiterated everything that he had said in his statement. He had kind of like random scars, you know, just from scars like on his hand or on his head and stuff. And so he said that these were from being attacked in Somalia and stuff like this. He was interviewed again on the 17th of September, 98. In December, his application was refused. And he was informed of this in February. Now, even that, I don't understand. <laughs> Why does it take two months to tell someone that their their application was denied? Like, it's a, it's a simple phone call, email, letter, whatever you have to do. Call them back in or something, I don't know. I don't know why it's taken that long. And again, like, things have just got worse. He appealed this decision and on June 3rd, 1999, he was interviewed again and it was determined that he would be granted asylum. Farah was said to like be in love with Ireland like he got really into some, the sport he so like that he always had Ireland jerseys and stuff he loved all supporting the Irish football team and stuff so after receiving his um status he was able to claim social welfare but he did also do like temp work in agencies and stuff like that and he had actually applied for citizenship on August 21st 2003 and this like application was actually still being processed or whatever at the time that he was murdered so while he was waiting for like the application to be approved and stuff, he lived in different parts. He lived in North Strand, he lived in the city centre, he lived down in Dunleary, this type of thing. He was described as friendly, but he was also described as an alcoholic and that he could drink up to three or four bottles of vodka a day. So he was actually very well known kind of around the city centre, especially in pubs. He integrated very well into the Somalian community, uh, both in Dublin and in Cork. And so no one apparently kind of like realised that he wasn't Somalian. So this is where another name comes in that the name isn't real, okay? So in August 1997, in Dr. Quirky's on O'Connell Street, it's like a big amusement arcade thing, Farah saw a girl called Lynn. And she was 16 years old, Chinese, and she had an intellectual disability. She was playing pool with one of her friends. And Farah just comes up, never met her before, and says, will you be my girlfriend? Like, I want you to be my girlfriend. I want to have your baby. Like, I want us to have babies and stuff like this. And so she says no, but she goes back to his, like, apartment with him. And she would later say that she was forced to have sex. And that they only had sex once. And she became pregnant. When she told him the next month that she was pregnant, he wanted nothing to do with it. I just want to read out um, a little bit that she later would tell the guardy. Farah was not violent to me. We had a nice relationship. I was with him for nine months and I only had sex with Farah once. Farah lived by himself in the flat down the road. When John, the baby, was born, like obviously again, not the name, was born, Farah never saw him. I think he was six years old when Farah first saw him. Farah called to the house here to see him. When I first met Farah, we used to play pool together. Sometimes Farah would phone me to meet with him. I didn't have a phone number for him. He would phone me because he had my number. The last time I saw him before March 2005 was last year. I was walking near Jury's on Parnell Street when I heard someone call me. Oh, when I looked, I see Farah. He stopped, but he told me he goes to work. He told me he stays in a hotel and that's where he lived. He didn't tell me the name of the hotel. Later on, though, Lynn would go on then to say um, that Farah had been violent and stuff like this. So she says about the relationship for nine months, but I kind of gather that it wasn't. Maybe he just kind of strung her along and stuff. I don't really know. Um, I kind of wonder, and this isn't, I'm not trying to do this as a broad generalization, but I kind of wonder, was it nearly like a backup for if his asylum hadn't been granted, that he needed to kind of have her on the hook to be like, yeah, but I have a, I have a child here. I don't know. But that was that for them. And then in April, 1998, the other girl, Paula, she was 16, it was her 16th birthday actually, and they were out in town. And Farah approached her, you know, on the street and started talking to her. And they started going out. Farah told her he was 20 years old. At this point, he was well into his 30s. So 
uh, started going out. Three months later, she was pregnant. But it was said that at the start, he was brilliant. Um, he moved into the family home. He got on really well with her family. He would go fishing with her dad, all of this. And that when their son was born, he was a, like a doting father. He was really, he really, you know, connected with the child. He was great. He was great with her, all of this. But Paula says that when their son was three months old, Farah changed. He started drinking. He became very aggressive. By this point, they were given um, like council housing. They were living in Dunleary. And so he started getting more aggressive. He started hitting her. And then it would come to the point where if she didn't want to have sex, he would want it and would take it anyway. And so it progressively got worse. Like the, the rape would become like a daily occurrence. The beatings would become a daily occurrence. He was always drunk. Paula called the guards several times, but never had the courage to leave Farah. When she did leave, he would ring her and say he was sorry and beg her and say that it would never happen again. And she would go back and of course it happened again. Again, remember, she's only like 17 at this stage. She's still very young. She says that he was like obsessed with knives. He collected knives and stuff like this. She said that during his benders, he would stand in front of the mirror in the hallway and like have conversations with himself. Like not just kind of like talking, you know, like having proper conversations where he was talking and then talking back to himself. It was like a two way conversation. On top of the rape and sexual abuse, he started to force her uh, to allow him to take photos of her. So he would tie her up in like different positions, real, you know, being degrading and stuff and would take these photos. She would later say that when she had tried to destroy the photos, he found her, he saw her, he went ballistic and, and battered her. So then at some point, another woman again named Avril, she was 25 and she moved in for a while. I don't know, was this kind of to supplement their income or whatever? They, they rented out a room or something. But like almost immediately, she saw this behavior. She saw how he was towards his girlfriend, how he would beat her, how he would get aggressive and drunk and all this. And then even it started to turn on her that he started to say like she was trying to convince her, uh, convince Paula to leave him and stuff. He was working at the time. He was doing the temp work. And so when he was out of the house, Paula would confide in Avril that this, you know, that he was controlling. He was doing these things. She told him about the, told her about the photos. And she said she was too afraid to leave because she knew he would just come after her. She said like he monitored her calls and texts. It grew, it seems like it grew from like jealousy and, and a, like obsession and possessive and stuff like that. That's where this all came from. So she wasn't allowed to go to like the shop or anything on her own without asking him first. This woman left like after only a few weeks, but kept in contact with Paula and would be ringing her to see if she's okay and stuff. And one night Paula rang her after midnight and was crying and upset and stuff. So Avril and a male friend went down to the house. The house was destroyed. Paula was on her hands and knees picking up glass. Uh, Farah was very annoyed, like aggressive asking, like demanding more drink and stuff. And then all of a sudden he just kind of like slumped back into a chair and his demeanor completely just changed he started laughing and stuff and like playing everything off and then eventually like that he went to sleep there were a lot more um examples of the abuse that paula dealt with but i'm not going to get into it all but again i'm going to tell you the books that i read for this case and if you want to you can go look into it that night when far had fallen asleep paula um avril asked paula to go like to leave with her and their son and she wouldn't and so the next morning, Avril rang Paula's parents and said that if they didn't go get their daughter, she would be dead. Her father immediately went and got her and brought her back to the family home. She does say at one point that she says she has nowhere to go. And so, again, I think that's kind of part of the mental abuse where like you kind of twist and trick your victim into thinking like they can't go home. There is nowhere for them to go, you know. She took a barring order out on fire, but this did not stop him. He stalked her and Avril for months and months. At one point in May 2001, they were in a pub in Dunleary and Farah arrives in drunk and starts like shouting and aggressive. He literally just starts smashing glass on the ground. Avril's dad was in the pub and actually went over and like called him to the side and said, if you don't, if you don't leave now and if you don't leave these girls alone, there's going to be trouble. And so he started apologising to him and left. Even though Paula had the barring order against Farah, he still was obviously like entitled to see his son. And so he would see him on a Sunday every two weeks. It was unsupervised. Okay, again, I don't know why. Paula got worried about her son. So Farah had this thing, and a few people will mention it, 
where he would burn himself with cigarettes. So if he was annoyed or upset or anything like this, he took his frustration out by like burning himself. And so one day, Paula's son came home and he had burn marks on his body. And Farah said he couldn't explain how they had happened, like what happened to them. So obviously she was afraid now that he was burning his son. Another time she said that he came home and started acting. Again, bear in mind by this point, the child's only two or three. They're still very young. Um, but the child came home and started acting very sexual. And so she was obviously worried because she thought, I don't know. She watched thought like, was Farah telling him to say things? Was Farah showing him things? I don't know. But soon after this then, Farah stopped stalking her. And as soon as his like interest went off Paula, his interest went off his son. He never saw his son again. So hopefully Paula and the son have gone on to be able to have healthy lives. As far as I know, she married and had another baby. So hopefully they're a nice little happy family unit now. Just before I continue, at this point, Farah has four convictions. He's obviously been like arrested so other times. He used to like start fights randomly with people and stuff like that. But he had four convictions, but no jail time. So every time he would either receive a fine or receive like a suspended sentence or probation or whatever. And we know my feelings on suspended sentences. The reason Farah's attention moved from Paula was because it had been diverted somewhere else. In the summer of 2001, in Coco's My Club in Tala, Farah met Kathleen Mulhall. So we are going to go through the Mulhall family tree. John Mulhall was 53. He had married Kathleen Ward, who was obviously named Kathleen Mulhall, in 1972. He had minor convictions for stuff before they got married, but once they got married, he settled down. And we're going to get into her in a minute. They then had six children. James, the eldest, was born in December 1972. Linda, who we'll get to next, she was born in 1975. Then John was born in 1977. Charlotte, who we will also get to, was born in 1983. Then there was Marie, who was born in 1984. And Andrew, who was born in 1988. All the other ages seem to be consistent, except Andrew has been described as 16, 17 and 18 in different sources. 16 and 18 mostly. Um, but by that logic, he is 16 by that, by the dates that were given him with sources. So we'll just go with 16 then. So it seems that the oldest children, James, John, Linda and Charlotte, all seem to get in trouble with the law. When our story takes place, John and James are actually in Weefield prison. James is in for like dangerous driving and causing the death of a passenger. He drove, he was out like this other fella and they were both drunk obviously and the other fella couldn't even like open the car so he was supposed to drive him home so then James drove him home and the car crashed and the other guy died so he was in prison for that and John was in for being the passenger in a stolen car but I believe it was because he didn't show up to that court date that an arrest warrant was uh, served and then that's why he was in prison as well. Andrew obviously was still young and then Marie was about 20 at this stage and she was actually an apprentice mechanic so she seemed to be on the ball. For the most part it seems like they were just this like normal kind of working class family but then kind of the more you dive into it it seems like they're not. They lived in 31 Kilclare Gardens in Jobstown and Tallet. So you know they were from a working class area but it was supposed to be kind of like a nice estate in the in Jobstown. John and Kathleen's marriage was supposed to be was said to be like a happy one a healthy one but in 1993 he had an affair and it just things just went the same after that. Kathleen would go on then to make allegations of abuse. Now I don't know if this was after she had met Farah or if it was before but some of the, again, some of the sources say that he was this great dad, he was devoted and he was, you know, a good guy and that, like that for the most part, he was never in trouble with the law and that essentially he just kind of failed in bringing up his kids. But other than, other sources do say that he was abusive to her and that he was abusive to the kids. And I'll just say it now before I forget, Linda, there's a whole thing where like Linda kind of says, and it is in different sources where she kind of puts blame on the dad almost in a way like that that he abused her or hit her or something and even in one of the sources it's Kathleen when she's speaking to the guards says like um yeah she you know and there's a whole thing with how Linda went off the rails it's like yeah well you can blame her dad for that one 
So I don't really know because there's no substantial kind of sources that say what happened. But, there, you know, it is said that she's like kind of blames the dad for everything that goes wrong. So before we get on to Kathleen and Farah, I'm going to give you a background on our two gals, Linda and Charlotte. Hi everyone, um, sorry, just me jumping into the end of the video. You'll remember me saying that I didn't think I was going to be able to do the entire case in one video. And unfortunately I can't. Even when I was recording it, I couldn't get all the recording done in one sitting, I'm afraid. Just time constraints. Um, so it is going to be in two batches. So what I'm going to do is I've cut it off kind of at a, at a good point. And then I'm going to start the next video with linda and charlotte's life and so i'm going to kind of re-record the bit that i had done and then continue on as a new video i'm sorry i didn't i didn't want to do that obviously um i'm not really into those type of videos but i'm gonna have them out hopefully kind of within a day or two of each other um i probably could have tried to just shove everything in into the one video but to be honest i decided i wanted to do a known case right so just to try it out so i done this one and i was reading so it's like i read like four books on it and which is why obviously it's taken longer because there's just so much information to look at and it was a lot I found out that I didn't know and I would have thought I knew a lot of it and to be honest like you can just look at the Scissor Sisters and that crime and you know but it starts a long time before that there's so much to it there's just layers and layers of how you get to March 2005 and so I that's I just decided that if I was going to do a known case I wanted to make sure that I was doing it like to the best fullest of my ability um so that being said that's that so i had also wanted to in this video say thank you to the people who donated to the gofundme that i done for coon Wira in athai which is a, a rehabilitation center so i'm i had said that i would just thank everybody who had donated so i'm just going to do that now so a huge thank you to everyone who did no matter what amount it was i, I really honestly i said two euro was enough so thank you so much. So there is um, Stacey D, Laura S, Cameron J, Bernadette L, John S, Melissa H and Teresa C. There is Megan O D, Patricia M, Vanessa O C, Michelle P, Rhonda S, Shona V, Danielle S, Suzanne F, Avril D. So again, I just want to say a huge thank you. So um, raised 269 euro. So it was just a bit over halfway of what I was hoping to get. So it's still going to go a long way. It's basically half of what one week costs to be there for the week for the treatment. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much. And then another thing that I wanted to do, and I've been wanting to do it for a while, but I said I was going to do it for like the video before Christmas. And obviously I had hoped to have this video out before Christmas and then covid and everything else um so i wanted to say thank you so i've like reached just over two thousand subscribers and i had been saying when i kind of reached that i was like oh do you know i, I just feel like i want to do something so sorry if this is cheesy or anything but i just really want to say thank you so i'm gonna do like a giveaway or a i don't know what you'd really call it i suppose what do the influencers call it um so basically yeah i'm just gonna i just said i'd wanted to give something and the easiest thing to do when you have like viewers from all over the world is to do an amazon gift card because it's amazon it's everywhere so i was trying to think of how to do it so i think i'm just going to do that on this video uh just comment and then just the best comment let's say is will be picked to be to be the winner oh my god you can see all my junk out there the best winner the best comments sorry it will be the best will be the winner so um it'll be uh i was trying to figure out the different currencies so i'm just gonna go with 25 for a pound euro or dollars i know that's kind of gonna be a little bit on each side i think it's like 22 something pound 26 dollars so we're just saying 25 because it's an easy nice number and then obviously if you win and you're from a different country i'll figure out what the currency is and convert 25 euros into that and that's what you'll get and it's easy because then i can just send it to you obviously i had said i was hoping to send that as like um a christmas present like i was hoping to have it out for christmas but i didn't so what we'll do is it'll be a new year's thing so happy new year's 
So I will say a week. Yeah, a week to just, I don't know, leave it up there and see how it goes. For the best comment and um, to keep things fair or whatever, I won't, I won't, I won't do, I won't do it. I let my, I was saying I let my nephew maybe because he likes true crime. I will let him, I'll ask him to pick out. So I'll get him to look through the channel and see what comment he thinks is the best. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, again, it's just a thank you. I know I'm always, I say thank you and stuff, but it's just, I just said I wanted to kind of, I don't know, do something for all the like, the support and sharing and commenting and everything you guys do. I hope you all have, have had, because by the time this video gets put up, an amazing New Year's. Ring in with your loved ones or on your own, because you're also a loved one. Whatever you've done, I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, quiet New Year's Eve for me, not doing anything. Um, I've had one drink. <laughs> I've gone red, and I assume it's because I had a drink. Um, yeah, tomorrow I'm having um a family over, so I have to do a Tesco order and get my little finger foods and stuff in. And yeah, that's it. So um, it's tomorrow I suppose it's kind of like Christmas because I didn't see anybody for Christmas, and I get to finally give presents out. Woo! So yeah, kind of just rambling on now. Most of you probably already know the case. Let me know if you didn't. If you didn't, right, if you don't know the case that I'm doing, don't look it up. And wait until the second part of the video and then be like, what? And then let me know. Because I would love to see. Because I remember the case and being like, this is mad. Like, uh, you know, especially like that because the, the body had been found and it was on the news. It was like a body has been found in the in the canal. Like, so, yeah, I'd love to have people experience that where it's kind of like I just wait what so thanks see you in the next video bye